All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out to uh, see Chef Christina here. Uh, the format today will be just to give you kind of uh, like the rules of the day. Uh, we'll have a we'll have an awesome talk by uh, Chef Christina in just a moment. If you have a uh, and it'll be followed by some Q and A. So if uh, you have a question, please go to the mic uh, because we are uh, recording this on YouTube. So they need to be able to hear you in the virtual world as well as the real world. Um, but uh, with that, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys all know why you're here today. Uh, Chef Christina, he's here from Momofuku uh, Milk Bar from New York City. Uh, you know her for her uh, compost cookies, her crack pie, uh, her blueberry cookies, and m many, many other fun and delicious, magically satisfying treats. So I'm sure you guys do not want to hear any more of me. So with that, uh, Chef Christina from Momofuku Milk Bar. Everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Um, this, is an <laughs> this is an insane turnout. Um, thank you to everybody for coming. Um, it's, I usually, we've been doing sort of talks like this. Um, the book came out on October 25th, so we've been doing this for about two and a half weeks on tour. And it's usually a much smaller group. And my first question is always sort of like, okay, who's ever been to Momofuku? Or who owns the Momofuku cookbook? Or, uh, who's been to Milk Bar and every once in a while you get like a hand or two raised and it's fun and it's fun to know that people came just out of curiosity but it's pretty amazing to see um, how many of you came because you know exactly why you're here. Um, so I will spare you with those silly questions. But um, So Momofuku Milk Bar. Um, Momofuku is this tiny little restaurant group um, that started in the East Village about seven years ago by Dave Chang the chef owner of the Momofuku restaurants. There was Momofuku Noodle Bar, Momofuku Sam Bar, uh, Momofuku Co, which is like a tasting menu only restaurant. You have to get your reservation online, um, only compete for your seats. Um, Momofuku Milk Bar opened next about three years ago um, in November. And we also have Ma Pesh, which is in Midtown outside of the East Village. And Dave recently opened a Momofuku restaurant in Sydney, Australia in the Star City Casino. Um, and it's going really well. Um, we now have four little bakeries, or four little retail milk bar locations um, in New York. We have our original East Village location. We have, our, um, we have a little location that is part of Ma Pesh in Midtown. We just opened a spot um, on the Upper West Side, 87th and Columbus near Central Park. Um, and we have our kitchen in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, um, where we also have a little store. Um, so hopefully many of you already own the Momofuku cookbook and you sort of know the history of the Momofuku restaurants and you know a little bit about Dave and the mentality and the attitude and the passion behind what we do at Momofuku in general. Um, I started working at Momofuku about six years ago. Um, I was, I am still, <laughs> but I was um, a home baker growing up. I, I grew up with a bunch of um, grandmas and aunts and a mom that really loved baking. Um, and I also have a very sweet tooth. Um, so I loved mixing cookie dough and eating it more so than baking it. But um, I started there with my love for, for baking and all things sweet and uh, cake batters and frostings and all of those sorts of things. And um, I went to college and I studied um, applied mathematics and the Italian language because I loved doing those things. I loved sort of learning and being stimulated and, and discovering these things. My mom's an accountant, so I think that's where the mathematics come into play. But um, I ended up graduating from school mostly to appease my parents. And, and I thought to myself, um, that I, it, I just, none of those things would really fit for me as a profession and that I wanted something more active and creative and stimulating in this way. And I feel like you all have like figured out a great, a great way to sort of to have that in your lives. But for me, I thought I want to work in a kitchen. I want to be a pastry chef. I want to make what my real passion is into my profession. Um, so I moved to New York to sort of sight unseen. I had only ever been to New York City for like three hours once when I was a teenager. And I just sort of like felt this draw 
to New York and I thought, I'm just going to move to New York and I'm going to go to pastry school and I'm going to be a pastry chef and that's what I'm going to do. And it just made sense in my head. So I just sort of told my parents one day, like, hey, mom, this is what I'm going to do. And without sort of ever really speaking about it more, like any further beyond that, I just had it set in my head. So I did it. Um, and I went to the French Culinary Institute and I studied pastry arts. And um, I ended up working in a bunch of fine dining restaurants in the city. Um, you know, six day work weeks, 16, 18 hour days, paid almost nothing because it, I just, I loved it so much. I loved the challenge. I loved learning. I loved that I was sort of, you know, making a life for myself and doing what I really love to do. And then, and that there was never no end and exhaustion never, it was never really, um, it never came into mind. Um, but as I was working in these fine dining restaurants and sort of working my way up the ranks of pastry kitchens and pastry departments, um, I sort of got jumbled up because I, uh, these fine dining restaurants usually are, um, are very detail oriented and they're very precise and they're very, um, I, I can only ever use the adjective finicky because for me in my head I see it as finicky. I see these like delicate twills that top, you know, a chocolate souffle as finicky and six different sauces and picking herbs and putting them on a plate for my personality was like I loved the challenge of it and I loved learning but for me it was far too finicky for me and so I sort of started to worry that I would never really actually become a pastry chef and I would never make it to the top because it wouldn't really be my on it, it wouldn't be honest to me and it wouldn't meet my, my need and my desire for being creative and being in a creative profession that, um, that had my voice. And so um, I sort of stepped out, I ended up sort of stepping out of the kitchen in New York and, um, and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I met um, Dave um, through Wiley Dufresne, who's the chef and owner at WD-50 in the Lower East Side, and it was the, actually the last kitchen that I worked in as a pastry cook, and it's, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's very high technique, very high, very forward thinking in terms of food, and the presentation of food, and, and pushing boundaries with what you can do with flavors and techniques and food. Um, and I ended, uh, Wiley ended up introducing me to Dave, um, to help him with this thing called a HACCP plan, which is a hazard analysis plan for sous vide cooking, which is, if you're, if you're not familiar, it's sort of like large scale, a large scale food saver machine called a cryovac machine that creates an oxygen free environment that you can cook in. And the health department in New York City had all of these brand new, very stringent regulations and Dave needed help. So I just, I had taught myself how to write these plans um, in working at WD-50 as a pastry cook and Wiley was just like, can you help my friend out? So I went and helped Dave out and he just offered me a job. He just said, oh, okay, you know how to do this sort of like silly, dorky, like overextended HACCP plan and you taught yourself it, so why don't you just come work for me? You know, like I have, I had noodle, he had noodle bar and sambar at the time. He was just sort of starting to like break out um, in terms of his, um, his presence in, in food and in the food world in New York. And he had a very, very small team um, of people. And I just said, okay, I'll do it. Because for me, I really didn't think I was going to make it as this pastry chef. And not because I wouldn't be able to, to get there with like, you know, hard work and determination, but because I just thought, maybe I have it all wrong and I'm just not creative enough or I'm just, I don't have that fine-tuned precision attention to detail enough to be this fancy pastry chef. So I took the job with Dave because, and I just said, yeah, I'll do it. Let's do it. I'll work for you. And there was no job role. It was very unkitchen related. It was like, okay, well, you know how to type on a computer. So how about you do payroll? And you type faster than me. So how about you type some recipes or, like, you know, the, the bathroom's clogged, call a plumber, figure out how to do it. And so that, and I loved that. I loved that challenge. I loved not knowing what I was doing and figuring it out. And I loved knowing that there was this huge outlet of things for me to learn how to do and to figure out how to do it. Um, and I loved that sort of uphill battle challenge that every day was going to be different and every day I was going to be on my feet and every day I was going to have to find a creative solution. And that for me was, it, it met enough of that need of what I wanted 
to do in a day. Um, so I did it. But the thing was, I'd go to work every day and do that, and then I'd end up coming home and baking in my kitchen at home late at night because that was my routine. It's what I love to do. It was like no matter how many hours I spent at work doing God knows what, all I really wanted to do was sort of go home and bake, and it was sort of like my peace and my happiness in my day. So I would do it, and I would go home, I'd bake, I'd bake one or two or three things, and I'd end up just bringing them in the next day to work to Dave and two or three other people that worked at Momofuku at the time, and, and feeding them because I, didn't, I couldn't leave it in my kitchen, then I couldn't go home and bake again, because I, would, you know, I wouldn't have an empty pan to bake something into. And Dave would just gobble it all up. Um, and he would always, after a few days or a few weeks of it, he would joke, you know, that we should put this brownie or this cookie or whatever it was that I threw together on the menu. Because at the time, noodle bar and sambar um, were very, very masculine, driven with sort of like masculinity and sort of a fast-paced, loud, loud music, loud flavors environment, but there was absolutely no value placed on dessert. There, there wasn't even dessert on the menu, which is sort of, I mean, even in New York City, it was very sort of strange to have a restaurant where there's no coffee, there's no tea, there's no dessert. You sit down, the music's playing loud, you order your food, you get it, it comes out warm, you eat it real fast because it's delicious, you pay your bill and you leave. Um, and so I always sort of thought he was joking about like, okay, I, dude, I just threw together these brownies at home with like whatever was in my cupboard, you know? It was more just an exercise of like peace at home to bake than it was intentional. And one day I showed up and halfway through the day he was sort of gobbling down whatever I had eaten and he was just like, go, go, get into the kitchen and make something for dessert tonight because I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm over it. This is clearly what you love to do, like finish payroll and then go and bake something. And we're going to put it on the menu tonight because I'm just, I'm over this. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, and so I freaked out a lot. And then silently, because there was very much sort of like a show no mercy attitude. That's, that's kitchen mentality in any city. That was sort of how I was raised too with like this stubbornness um, and... I did it. I made a dessert. It was a strawberry shortcake with my own sort of twists on it. Um, it's in the Momofuku cookbook. Um, and it was fine. Enough, no one died. A few people ordered it. A few people ate it. It was good. Um, and so I came back the next day and did my normal sort of job of whatever it was that came up. And then I made it again and again. And eventually I ended up putting desserts on the menus at the Momofuku restaurants, little by little, I sort of had my fingerprints on the menus at those restaurants. And um, it was sort of like one of those, like, what do you put on the menu at a restaurant that doesn't serve dessert, that no, there's not really any value placed on dessert, but these guys clearly love sweets, because when I bring in these, like, platters of things, they're gone in minutes. And it's, it was that it's, it's Momofuku means lucky peach in Japanese, but Dave is a Korean-American chef, but we use local ingredients, but we use French technique, and sometimes we put a pasta on the menu, and what in the world do you make for dessert in, that, in those terms? And it's just like, well, all I know about working here is that you know, it's fast-paced, the flavors are big, they're bold, they're in your face, everything always tastes delicious. It's so delicious that you want to eat it so quickly and then get up and leave. And so I would, I would just, I would, I would do whatever I could to make a delicious, flavorful, seasonal thing with a twist and a personality because that was the only sort of anchor that I had in knowing Momofuku and in knowing the food of Momofuku and the personalities of Momofuku. Um, so I did that for about a year and it was just me and I would sort of just find whatever space I had on a prep table in one of the restaurants and just throw as many things together as I could. And um, one day there was a, um, a vacant laundromat next to Sambar um, on 2nd Avenue and 13th Street and um, they lost their lease. They were taking all the washers and dryers out um, and Dave ran, found whatever little corner I was occupying on a prep table and, and ran up to me and, and said, the, the, the laundromat's going out of business. Somebody's going to move in and take over this space and like run Momofuku out of, like they're going to destroy us and they're going to crumble our empire, which of course is not going to happen, but he sort of has this like paranoia about him and this energy about him because of it. And it was just like, we got to get in there. Let's open a bakery do you want to do it? Like, let's open this bakery. And this is like, 
bringing up a concept that had never been spoken about between the two of us. It was, I'm, sh I'm sure it was clear that I loved cookies <laughs> um, and I loved baking cookies and there was never a cookie on the menu at Sambar, at Noodle Bar, at Co because that just wasn't the vibe of those, of those restaurants. And um, I was just like, sure, yeah, sure, I'll do it in my head. You know, like every little girl dreams about having a bakery. <laughs> so, sure, I'll do it. And it was like, I'm serious. Do you want to do it? If you say yes, we have to do it right now. And it was like, yeah, OK, I said yes, let's do it. <laughs> and so we just did it. And it was sort of like one of those phone calls home to my mom where it was, it was similar to like, hey, so mom, I'm going to move to New York City and go to pastry school and become a pastry chef. and. I'm going to get on a train tomorrow. And it was the same sort of thing where it's like, hey, mom, I'm going to open this bakery, and it's going to open in like a month. And I'll tell you when that is sort of thing. And that, and then you just do it. And, that's, and it's sort of like that being a person of your word and suppressing all of the like fear and um, doubt and all of those things in your head and just sort of pushing through. Um, and we sort of, I like to say that we opened the bakery overnight, though it, took a, though, it, though it took a little while to renovate this laundromat into a bakery. But um, it ended up sort of being this bakery that, um, in my head, it makes sense to the way Momofuku and the Momofuku restaurants and the, Momofu, the restaurant menus are in terms of food and flavors and curiosities. Um, but we ended up opening this bakery. And I like to sort of describe it as this sort of quirky bakery with you know an American baked good sensibility but with a little bit of a twist or with a little more personality because instead of chocolate chip cookies we sell cornflake chocolate chip marshmallow cookies or instead of chocolate chip cookies we sell compost cookies that have chocolate chips in them but they also have butterscotch chips and pretzels and potato chips and coffee grounds and stuff like that um, and it making the menu was sort of just making a bunch of stuff that I knew I loved baking at home, or, or you, you know, making this cookie dough and then throwing whatever I had in my cupboard into this cookie dough. Um, and it made sense in my head. And I was too busy to worry about it not making sense in anyone's head, anyone else's head. And I sort of got tricked into being this pastry chef that I didn't know that I was or that I could be. And I ended up making this menu that I thought, well, I'm just going to make what makes sense in my head and what's honest to what I love to bake and what I know how to bake and what I know what I love to bake for somebody or for family meal or for what have you. And it's honest and it feels right. And then I'm not going to worry about anything else. And so um, everything that we sell, I think, makes sense in our head, though most people ask sort of how we come up with it or how it came to be. Um, and um, so we brought a lot of stuff for you guys to taste um, so that you could sort of understand our food beyond, you know, um, strip it down for you beyond like just a cookie. Um, so for me, making this menu for a bakery was sort of like, OK, I've been training to be a pastry chef for many years. Um, what do most what do pastry chefs where do you start? Where do you start? Do you start with flavor? Do you start with texture? Um, do you start with technique? And for me, I would sort of strip it down to my favorite things that I loved making as a pastry cook in other people's pastry kitchens. And um, I'm a real creature of texture. I love crunch. And uh, just even if it's not crunch as a texture, it's silky smooth or it's sandy or um, it's crummy or what have you. And so we start. we started playing around with these crumbs and crunches, um, which makes sense in my head, but they're these flavors, of, are these, they're these pops of color and flavor and texture. And um, the, the cookbook is sort of laid out with these, with these basic techniques and ingredients that we love to use in our kitchen when we start to bake, when we start to, to um, develop our menu in a new recipe. And um, one of the things that we love making is a crunch. And we brought cornflake crunch today. Um, and it's, it's made with cornflakes, so that always makes people smile. And it's sort of a flavor that most people know and can relate to. Um, and we toss it with some sugar and some salt and some melted butter and some milk powder. And we just sort of spread it out on a sheet pan and, and toast it off in the oven. So you sort of get an idealized version of cornflakes or maybe an idealized version of frosted flakes or something like that. Um, but they're, um, 
in, in most pastry kitchens, you'll use something like this that, that has this like flavor and texture um, and broken down sort of organic nature. And you'll use it to just put on the bottom of a plate to hold a scoop of ice cream so that it doesn't slide around on the plate when it goes to the table. So, but for me, I thought, well, OK, well, what I, I want to make this crunch or this crumb, and, and what else can I, can I do with it? And so we would just play around with flavors until we got a, a lot of fun different crunches. We make one with Ritz crackers. We make one with Fruity Pebbles. We make one with, it's basically any, we make one with pretzels. And it's basically anything that already has a flavor and a texture that you just sort of crumb, crumble up with your hands. Butter, sugar, salt, maybe some milk powder, you bake it off. And then we'll take these little things, these little like snacky items, and we'll, we'll see how many places we can put them on restaurant menus and on our bakery menu. And we make um, a cornflake chocolate chip marshmallow cookie. And it's a chocolate chip cookie, but we fold these, this cornflake crunch into it and we put these mini marshmallows in it. And all of a sudden we sort of have like this like amped up version of a chocolate chip cookie. Um, and we'll take this cornflake crunch and we'll use it as an ice cream topping. Or we'll take it and we'll crunch it down a little bit more and we'll press it into a pie tin and use it as a crust for, we'll use it as a pie crust instead of your average pie crust because um, why not? And I don't want to make a pie crust. I have this great snacky thing that, I mean, I personally will just, we have little cups to pass around for you guys to taste, but it's good to just sort of throw back or make it into a trail mix or make it into a granola and, um, instead of starting off with something like a pie crust or instead of starting off with just looking at flour, sugar, and butter as like a dough, how else, how can I start from a more creative standpoint? And then that's my staple ingredient that I use and I see how far I can push it. Um, you can layer it in a cake for flavor and texture and, and a visual um, appeal and you can play with the flavor of cornflakes or you can play with the flavor of cereal and you can substitute it in and out and so we start with these instead of starting with just butter and sugar instead of starting with just a cake recipe we'll start with these crumbs and these crunches because you're, you're starting from like a platform of something a little bit more creative or a little different or you're starting with something that doesn't already exist in everybody else's kitchen um, we make this thing called a milk crumb. And it's sort of like a sandy burst of flavor. And in a lot of pastry kitchens um, and savory kitchens, they make them, sometimes they call them crumbs. Sometimes they call them sand. It was a very sort of like 90s thing with the Audria brothers. And um, even at WD50, we would make um, red onion sand and soil. We would make coffee soil. Um, and it's just sort of like this sandy burst of flavor. Um, but when I started menu developing for Milk Bar, I thought, I love this technique. I would stand in the kitchen when no one was looking and just eat these crumbs <laughs> as my snack. Um, and I would you know, pour milk over them and eat them as cereal. And so I thought, well, I'm going to take that technique and see what I can do with it in terms of flavor that pushes it beyond what I already know. And again, we would use this, and we would sort of drape it over a plate of uh, foie gras WD-50 for, for flavor and for texture. We'd, we'd sprinkle a little down on a plate and then put a, put a scoop of ice cream or a canel of sorbet on it. But for me, I thought, well, what else can we do with this? And um, it's milk powder. It's milk powder. I don't know if anyone's mom or dad ever like used milk powder and made them drink, you know, hydrated it with water and made them drink milk as a kid. I did, <laughs> and it was gross back then, but I thought, Let's use this milk powder, which is sort of a staple in any pastry chef's kitchen because you typically put it in ice cream to give it more body and flavor. Um, let's make like an idealized version of what milk should taste like. In my head, milk should be like sweet and milky and um, a little savory, but to have this balance that regular milk doesn't really have. My mom used to make me drink skim milk as a kid and I hated it. So it was like, I want to take what I think milk should taste like and then make that into a crumb. So it's, it's flour, it's butter, it's sugar, it's milk powder as sort of like the dried flavor ingredient that goes into it. And we put a little white chocolate in here. Um, and then we take this crumb and we fold it into a cookie dough and we have a cookie called the blueberry and cream cookie. And it's sort of like, if you think, I think about milk crumbs and I go, okay, it's milky, it's creamy. So then I think about 
peaches and cream, and then I think about blueberries and cream, and then I think about a blueberry muffin, and then I think about the best part of a blueberry muffin, which is like the tippy top of the muffin, where it's like a little fudgy and a little crunchy, and we make it into a cookie. So we take these milk crumbs and we fold them into a cookie dough with dried blueberries. Um, we'll also sort of take it and we'll use it in a plated dessert for one of the restaurants and we'll make a peach sorbet because peaches and cream make sense to everybody. Um, and then we'll, we take some graham crackers and we'll blend them down into um, a puree that we like to call a ganache because it's, it sort of represents a little bit more texture and body in like the world of cooking and pastry chefdom. And all of a sudden you have milk crumbs and peaches for like a peaches and cream element and then you have peach, uh, this peach sorbet and this graham cracker ganache and it gives you this sort of like peach cobbler effect. And all of a sudden we're just using the same crumb that we use in so many different things but we're, we're figuring out how many different places we can repurpose it and how creative we can get with it. Um, we layer it in a pistachio cake that has layers of pistachio cake and lemon curd and these milk crumbs and pistachio frosting and it gives a nuttiness and a floralness and this sweet milkiness that brings out both and enhances it. It gives it texture and it gives it a visual pop and um, it makes sense and it's fun and it tastes good. And you know, all of a sudden we've created five or six desserts out of two things that we really just sort of like snacking on in our kitchen. <laughs> Um, we also have a birthday crumb that's sort of like, um, did anybody's mom or dad or sister or aunt or uncle ever make them um, a box funfetti cake for <laughs> their birthday? For me, that's like the best birthday cake ever. Um, and we thought, okay, we're going to be this quirky bakery with baked goods. It should be, it's personal to us. We want it to have personality and we want it to you know, all baked goods should, should feel like home and should be made with love. And for me, it's sort of like that funny dichotomy of like, well, this box cake mix that you just add like um, eggs and oil to, um, it tastes like home because that's what you make for your kid when you're, you know, you're trying to raise a family and you want to make a birthday cake. So we took our love for that like Funfetti box cake mix and we totally deconstructed it to so many people make this box cake mix from a box. How about if we figure out how to make it from scratch? Because those flavors are the flavors of sort of home and the flavors of that you relate to and that you remember and that like send this signal or this eye, you know, they make your eyes sort of get wider. Um, and how do we make that flavor from scratch? And so we would take the back of the box of a, um, the, we take the Funfetti cake mix home and we look at the back of the box and just start deconstructing like how are we going to recreate these flavors in our kitchen and we figured out how to remake the cake from scratch and we figured out how to um, make frosting that tastes just like it's that canned fr that shelf stable canned frosting that you like eat through your childhood and through college and um, we ended up making these crumbs out of it as well and it's, it's a lot it's, it's the same ingredients that are in a cake but instead of making it into a cake with butter and eggs and oil, we make it into a little crumb with just a little bit of melted butter and we'll take it and we'll fold it into a cookie to make a confetti cookie and we'll layer it into that birthday cake that we make from scratch for more texture and more flavor. Um, and we go, that's how we go. We go from there. We start with these crumbs or these crunches. We make uh, this milk called cereal milk and it's meant to taste like what's left in your bowl after you eat all the cereal out of it, which is a flavor that everybody knows whether it's you know made with Lucky Charms or made with Captain Crunch or um, made with Golden Grahams. Everybody knows that flavor of milk like everyone's sort of done that before and so that's a recipe that we'll start with in our kitchen um, and we'll see how many places we can put it. We make it into drinking milk, we make it into ice cream, we set it with a little bit of gelatin and we make it into a panna cotta and all of a sudden we have one simple sort of approach and one simple flavor and we have three or four new menu items. We'll take this cornflake crunch and press it into a crust and then fill it with cereal milk ice cream because it makes like it just makes sense. Um, and we're just using things that are already in our kitchen. We're using these recipes that are already in our kitchen. Um, so when we went to write the cookbook um, and tell the story of Milk Bar and how it came to be and the attitude and the mentality behind it, um, and the sense of humor behind it, um, we broke it down based on these recipes, which we like jokingly refer to as mother recipes. 
and we were sort of related back to French cooking and friend in French cooking you have mother sauces and it's sort of this well-known principle that if you know how to make these mother sauces, if you can master these mother sauces in French cooking, sort of gateway towards mastering French cooking in a whole is, is yours. And these, French, these mother sauces are sort of the gateway to mastering everything else in French cooking. Um, and so we sort of approach um, milk bar with the same sort of mentality where it's like if you know how you know there's cereal milk if you learn how to make cereal milk you have this gateway into what we do at milk bar if you once you get the cornflake crunch down or the milk crumb down you have this sort of like world of desserts opened up to you and that's how we do it in our kitchen we we get creative by starting with really creative sort of like staple pantry ingredients we make this thing called liquid cheesecake because if I'm if I were going to be a fancy pastry chef I might make blue cheese cheesecake um, and serve it with figs or poached pears or something like that but I'm not <laughs> I want like underbaked cheesecake because that's the best part of cheesecake for me it's like that little ring in the center when somebody doesn't bake it all the way and I just want to spoon that out so if we're if I'm going to be a pastry chef I know that like cheesecake is a staple thing to pastry chefs, but my cheesecake's gonna be liquid cheesecake because that's the best part of cheesecake for me. And I'm not afraid to say it. And like it might be a little lowbrow, but like it gets a laugh and you get it because that's sort of it's like everyone's dirty little secret, you know? And that's what we have in our kitchen, and that's what we use as sort of like our jumping off point, and that's how the cookbook is laid out. It's like we make this liquid cheesecake. We layer it on this bread dough and make a cinnamon bun pie because if you think about cinnamon buns, it's bread dough and it's cinnamon and sugar and light brown sugar and then you roll it up and then you lather it in cream cheese frosting. So I'm going to take this liquid cheesecake I have and I'm going to use it to get towards this idea of a cinnamon bun in a different shape and a different vehicle. but. The flavors are there and they make sense and everyone knows the flavor of a cinnamon bun, but we make it into a pie with liquid cheesecake. <laughs> um, and I think that personality and that sort of honesty about baking and baked goods and pastry is very much the path that we take when we made Milk Bar at the very beginning and when we're coming up with new menu items every day and that is really important to us and I think the underlying sort of thing for us is um, I, I started making these desserts at this restaurant where everything's loud and masculine and in your face and dessert didn't exist before and in order for it to be worth my time I it's not like a I want dessert to be the shining star but damn it I came to work today and I worked really hard and my I want everything that we serve as a dessert to stand out but at a tasting menu only restaurant when there are you're already sort of getting stuffed with 12 courses and the last two courses are dessert it's like how do you get how do you make your dessert memorable and how do you make it poignant and how do you make it stand out or how do you make people want to remember their 13th and their 14th course when they've been sitting down and eating for two hours already and I think that was that's always the sort of like underlying motivation the underlying sort of like check this is the right this is it we're done we're done recipe testing this is making it to the menu and well it still needs some work and, and some of our recipes are immediately they hit you you have it you know you've got it and other ones are like we're constantly tasting and testing because it has to sort of pass that taste test where even in our kitchen full of like cookie dough and cake batter you just want to keep going back and eating and munching and almost making yourself sick because it's got a it's got a hit home like that and it doesn't have to be a childhood memory and it doesn't have to be a, be a breakfast memory but those are those are things that help strike a chord with people and make your eyes it makes your eyes open it makes you want to come back for more it makes you want to like beg your friend before they get on their flight to go to the bakery and pick up a bunch of cookies because somehow you have a relationship with it and that's what baked goods are that's what they are for me I have a relationship with oatmeal raisin cookies because my grandma used to make them 
for me all the time when I was a kid. And I don't want anybody else's oatmeal raisin cookie, but if there's something about a dessert that sort of taps into that like cinnamony, sugary, oatmeal-y, raisin-y flavors on any level, I'm sold. I will never forget it because that's, that's how I was raised with baked goods. And that's, that's for me, what feels like home and what, what impresses me the most. And, and those are the home run dishes. And those are the things I remember. And it's the same thing with savory food, but we're in the dessert world. And so we're constantly sort of looking at it as this sort of competition on a level where it's like, I, how do we, how do we tap into that as well? And it has to be the most delicious thing that anyone's ever ate. Otherwise it doesn't make it onto the menu because that takes extra time and it takes extra effort, but that's how you sort of make a bakery like this and a restaurant group like Momofuku and a dessert program like we have. And um, that is sort of the essence of what we do at Momofuku and what we do at Milk Bar and what you get in the cookbook beyond just the recipes of like, okay, you get the compost cookie recipe, I promise, but you get this personality and this approach and this realness about it where you sort of understand where it comes from and it's you're you're one of us i mean we we sort of like let you into our kitchen and our mentality and our point of view and we tell bad jokes in the book <laughs> we um and we break it all down so that's what you're taking home um but I want to see what kind of questions you guys have because that's personally, I get a little itchy when it's time to talk. But my favorite part is answering questions because the dialogue of it, I think, is really important. So who has questions? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Julie. I love Milk Bar. Uh, I went there like three years ago. Oh, and the got very engaged beginning. near there with my husband and his brother. So, you know, I'm really connected to the food and everything. So when I went back recently, uh, your cookies changed a little bit. So they were packaged, mm -hmm. they tasted different, the shapes were different. Uh, so I wanted to hear you speak a little bit about how growing and expanding has changed your recipe and if you think it's still... Uh, I mean, it's, it's still really delicious, but it's different. So yeah. we had a different experience going back recently than we did three years ago. Yeah, so we opened Milk Bar in the East Village three years ago, um, and we did all of our baking on site. And it was actually just me and two other people that opened the bakery. And we worked day and night. We had no clue what we were doing. We just knew that we had a delicious product that we stood behind. And we had very little resources and very little equipment. And we ended up working, you know, from 6 a.m. until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning for days and days and days and months. And it ended up being such a huge, we, we baked it, we mixed everything on site, we baked everything on site, we sold everything ourselves. Um, and it ended up being this sort of like crazy success, line out the door from open till close, from 8 a.m. till midnight, we would have a line out the door and we would kill ourselves just we would the compost cookie is everyone's favorite you know we would end up mixing this dough so many times over the course of the day and scooping it and trying to find room in our in our small refrigerators to find a place to chill it before we baked it and then we would scoop them into um, paper bags on the fly while they were still kind of warm because in hopes that people were going to eat them right away and if they didn't they were going to like grease their bags and break down because we were so overwhelmed with it and I think that's what made it such a success at first because it felt so personal and human and it's still very personal to us but the thing that people um, forget sometimes with bakeries we've had like a crash course on not only like how to how to open a bakery but like how to be a business person on this really weird level that was completely un, unslated is that you have to sell a lot of cookies to pay your rent in New York City, to, to pay hardworking people a wage that is not 
like poverty that where they're not like living with six people in bunk beds with bed bugs and you know like in order to pay people that that believe in what you do and what they do an honest wage you have to sell a lot of cookies and we 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 were put in this space because we thought we would sort of just be this cute little bakery that sold breads and flavored butters and cookies and the demand of the business and the cookie sales were was so huge that we were all, all of a sudden sort of in this small space with this dedicated team that was getting paid next to nothing and working day in and day out. And it was like, we're never gonna be able to sustain this. We're gonna kill ourselves trying to make enough cakes and layer them all in this 250 or 300 square foot kitchen space. And we, we got to the point that we were taking refrigerators and like illegally putting them in, in portions of where our customers would stand in line and wait or try and eat and lock them and illegally like illegally do it through the health department because it was like you're gonna get mad if I don't have a compost cookie and you're gonna get mad you know and I'm gonna get mad if I don't have a compost cookie for you but I don't know how else to do and it got to the point that we were shipping cookies because people want to have cookies on the west coast you know if they can't make it to visit us and we would we got to the point where we just started taking tables out of the bakery for patrons and we would just start stacking boxes of tins and stuff like that. We had no shipping area and so we would just be like, you can't have this table. You cannot eat crack pie at this table because I'm going to put an ugly tablecloth on it and I'm going to pack stuff and send it up and all of a sudden we were sort of affronted with like, well, well what do we do and what's important and what's our vision and we ended up being like, we need a bigger boat. If we're going to do this, we need a bigger boat and we're getting to the point that we're almost selling enough cookies that we can start to pay people a wage that's somewhere, just somewhere near honest. It's not even close to it, but we're to the point where we can provide health insurance for our employees, which is like unheard of in the restaurant industry, especially in New York. And we have to keep going because we're almost to the point where, where we can do it all, we can have it all, and we can have lives, and we can do what we love. And we ended up getting a bigger kitchen in Williamsburg. And believe it or not, our cookie recipes haven't changed at all. We use the exact same ingredients, but the things that have changed are we make them off-site. And we used to scoop every single cookie by hand, but all of a sudden we were affronted with uh, nobody scoops fast enough for me. Like, like the test of our kitchen used to be like, okay, well you can get hired if you can scoop cookies almost as fast as me because I'm gonna love it more than anyone and I'm gonna be faster than anyone, so I'm gonna scoop, 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 and then all of a sudden it was like, we're gonna need to hire 12 people just to scoop enough cookies, you know? And so we had to be smart about our strategy and how we do it. We package everything, honestly, because in New York City, you are not allowed to bake product off-site and send it to another, lo you're not allowed to bake something on site and send it to another location to sell retail unless it's packaged and it's labeled with every ingredient and every potential allergy. And all of a sudden it's like, we, we love what we do on the same level, but we have to figure out a way to make a concession here or there so that we can, so everyone can know what a compost cookie is. And you don't get as big of a bit of a pretzel in it now, but if we write a cookbook, then people can still make it at home, and it's still special to us, even though it's not. We're not. We used to be in this 250 square foot space with this small group of five or six people that would just kill each other, like lifting things up and over and under. And now we're in this huge kitchen, and it's like, how do we maintain our sense of family and our passion for it and our love for it? And we still do it every day. And we sometimes joke that like we do not miss that space at all because it was so hard but we miss it so much because we know exactly what the places that we had to make the concessions and that we had to say you want to know what I am not going to be here every day to scoop cookies and to be the only one that scoops cookies if I could I would but I can't you know, and and we still stand behind what we do. Well, thank you for scooping the cookies yeah. the day that I was there. Hey, Christina, thanks so much for coming. Your passion's like so obvious uh, <laughs> to all of us. You've already actually started to talk about this, but like I remember I went to the noodle bar the first time, and and now you're every time I hear about you guys, right? It's like you have an uptown location, like there's a bakery. You're now in Sydney. 
And you're kind of already we're going along these lines, but like, how do you maintain this kind of like Mama Fuko sense, like in the passion and all that, like as you guys kind of grow? Because you guys seem like interminable, right? Like it's like every time you just, <laughs> there's nothing's going to stop you guys, right? I mean, the the passion's so obvious, and like the the innovativeness is so so cool. Like, how do you how do you maintain that? Like, what is it what is it that like keeps you guys special? Um, it's 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 really hard. I mean, I think that having a personality and maintaining your love for it is so important, and it's one of those things that no one talks about. And I want my cookie, or I want my bowl of ramen, you know, and I want it now. And the attitude and the um, the personality behind it is what makes it, and what drives it, and what keeps it going. And it's something that we probably spend hours talking about in our kitchen in, in Milk Bar, we spend hours talking about each one of our cooks and each one of our employees and where they're at and how can we get everyone to contribute and know that they're part of this family. And we'll do everything from like, okay, we're, we're recipe testing or we're menu developing for the next Momofuku noodle bar soft serve flavors. Who has an idea? Fall's coming up. I don't care if you're a dishwasher. I don't care if you are the one that puts the stickers on the backs of the bags of cookies. You're here for a reason and you have, you know Momofuku and you know Milk Bar on a level. And like, what's next? You tell me, like, how are we going to do this together and how are we going to drive it together? And I think creating that sense of family and care and being like, if I have to put a cookie in a bag with a label on it to make sure that you're here and you can make a living and you can be a part of it, then that's what we're going to do. How are we going to do this? And so I think it's about hiring good people and banding together and figuring out a way to continue to perpetuate the message and the passion. And the rest of it comes organically. I mean, the rest of it is like gut checking and it's like, I don't know if I want to open a milk bar in Australia. It would be awesome to live in Australia, but like, is that the, cons it, for milk bar, it's like we have this team and we're a team. And if we move to Australia, that means part of our team and our family is going to sort of move away. And is that what we want to do? Can we, can we sustain it? Can we maintain it? And that's the question that happens every time we open a, a new Momofuku, whether it's a savory restaurant or it's a milk bar. It's like, why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Is this what we want to do? And it becomes this very cerebral thing where you think like, you're cooks, you're chefs, you come up with new menu things and you, you, know, and you put them on the menu and they're great. And it ends up being a, this much more like business savvy, cerebral, family meeting time sort of thing about it. And I think that's the part of having a restaurant group and running restaurants and running a bakery that people forget and miss, but it actually is a huge portion of our day and our week and figuring out how do you do it? You have to constantly change. You have to constantly learn. You have to eat out. You have to, you know, um, take in. You have to do all those things. And how do, you, how do you keep with it? And how do you keep fresh? And how do you keep a personality? And how do you keep your stuff trendy but not trendy, you know what I mean, trendy but not trendy, and how do you stand on your own island and do it with a group of people, and it's, I don't know what the answer is, all I can tell you is that it's something that we spend a huge amount of time on figuring out and talking about, and, and every, we change, we change every, every, every single day, like, okay, we think this was a, this is a great idea, let's do it today, and then three days later, it's like, that's a terrible idea, let's not do it at all, you know, or, I'm gonna paint the floor over here because it's gonna make everyone feel great about working this station, you know, and we just work, we constantly change and that's how we stay. We're never stagnant, we constantly, whether it's something big or something small or something that goes on a menu or um, how we tray up cookies before they get baked off in the oven or whatever it is. And we just constantly stay over in, over our head, always. <laughs> cool, you haven't stumbled yet. I haven't found anything <laughs> I didn't like, so thanks. Thank you. I just had a quick question about like what would be the one thing that you could bake literally all day and not get tired of? Um, that's a great question. I mean, for me, I feel like it's the answer is always cookie dough because, you know, mixing it, eating it, baking it. Honestly, we were doing a book talk yesterday night at Omnivore and someone was like, oh, I'm, I currently work in a bakery, but I think I want to work in a restaurant and don't you miss like working service and plating desserts? And I was like, no, I don't miss it at all. And the reason that I knew I wanted a bakery and love what I do is because 
I could do any of those things all day, every day. If I had to stand there and put cookies in a bag all day, every day, I would happily do it and it would be my favorite activity. Because it would mean that somebody's, that many people are eating the blueberry and cream cookie and that for me is like, I'll do whatever it takes and it never gets old. <laughs> Thank you, and will you be making them for the holidays then? Ma making the blueberry and co cream cookies for the holidays? We're, for the holidays, we have planned to take the cornflake chocolate chip marshmallow cookie and crush up candy canes and peppermints and fold them in. The recipe's also in the cookbook. It's one of our favorite things to do over the holidays. One, because no one wants to say goodbye to any of the cookies out here. So you have to like make a holiday cookie within the realm of the current offerings because if you take the compost cookie away or the corn cookie away, I'll tell you what. There's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> thank you. Hey, Christina, thank you so much for coming today on behalf of everyone at Google. I think that's it for questions. I know a lot of people still want to get their books, and they're available back there. I know she also brought a lot of really yeah. great treats. We brought a ton of cookies and crumbs and crunches, so come up. <laughs>